McGregor welcome you to a place where all kinds of phenomena flourish. Here, voices whisper ancient secrets, signs and symbols are abundant. UFOs, ETs, ghosts, and even the dead move about freely. Pilots fly into the Bermuda Triangle and live to tell about it. Dreams and visions of future events come true. Mind-to-mind communication is the norm. Here, we meet authors, researchers, and investigators of the mysterious, the strange, and of the inexplicable anomalies that surround us. Step out of the everyday world and take a journey into the mystical underground. Okay, this is our first episode in the Mystical Underground new podcast. I'm Rob McGregor. And Trish McGregor. So we're the authors of more than a hundred novels and nonfiction books. Many of the latter are self-help uh, and explorations of the unknown. And we're both winners of the Edgar Allan Poe Award for mystery writing. And our latest joint effort is called Phenomena: Harnessing Your Psychic Powers, which is now out in print and as an ebook and coming out in audio soon. My latest novel is called Tool Puzz. And Trisha's latest novel is? Skin Shifters. Uh, We've been writing about synchronicity and the paranormal for years uh, in books and on our blog, synchrosecrets.com, or blog.synchrosecrets.com. So a podcast really seemed like the next step for us. We want to have a good time and an informative time talking together and with others about all the phenomena discovered in the mystical underground. One thing about us, we do it all. Some podcasts on the paranormal won't touch UFOs and aliens, for instance, but in the mystical underground, we're interested in all the mysteries of the unknown. We'll be starting out, we think, with 30-minute podcasts and extend them to 60 minutes with guests who are experts in different facets of the paranormal. So thank you for joining us. Okay, so we met, Trish and I met in 1981, a couple of years after the Mario boat lift in which 100,000 Cubans came into Florida. I was a newspaper reporter and uh, covering that event and uh, and also the education beat in Broward County, Florida. And Trish was teaching English as a second language uh, through Florida International University. Uh, and she was teaching many of these uh, Cuban refugees. And I was uh, on an assignment to find out if these new uh, arrivals were learning English and blending into the American culture or just uh, staying in little Havana with the uh, in Miami with the with the Cuban culture. And um, so that's how we met. And one of the first questions I asked Rob after when we talked after he did his piece, um, if he knew what synchronicity was. My test question. And I I said, I kind of know a meaningful coincidence. Isn't that it? And anyway, I asked him to reach, and that was my test question, and he passed. So I asked him to return to our class and show the students slides <clears throat> from his various trips to South America. I subsequently discovered that Rob hated his job as much as I disliked teaching, although I liked teaching the Marielitos, just teach, teaching in general I didn't like. So we started, over the next year, we started freelancing and saving our money. We could quit our jobs with 5000 saved, got married left for a six-week honeymoon in South America. Yeah, I I think, uh, as I recall, it was only three weeks, but uh, if I make it six weeks, it sounds more uh, romantic, I guess. (laughs) Okay. Two and two. So, um, anyhow, yeah, uh, I didn't hate journalism by any means. I loved it, but it was just uh, I was with a a newspaper and an editor that made things uh, more difficult and necessary and uh, miserable. So I was <laughs> looking for something else, and freelancing sounded like such a better option. So I was, uh, you know, ready ready to go, even taking a chance. So quitting my job with just five thousand dollars saved, and then uh, uh, there was a new Chilean airline. It had this offer: two hundred ninety nine dollars for a round trip from Miami, and you could stop in Ecuador and Colombia and Chile. And so we do, we went to Ecuador and then to Colombia on this trip and had a and great time. Chile. Right. So anyhow, we well, and then we came back, uh, continue working as freelance writers. And uh, within 
uh, a few months we were out of that uh, $5,000. We were selling magazine articles, but it, it, the the pay was low and the pay was slow. <laughs> so for the next year, we took part-time jobs. Trish is teaching again uh, English as a second language <laughs> at Florida or at uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, High School uh, at night school, and I was uh, working for a a weekly newspaper. Uh, it was actually a full-time job, but I did it in 20 hours and um, and kept working on the freelance stuff. So uh, that went on for a year, and then uh, Trish sold her first novel, which was called In Shadow, and I landed a ghostwriting project shortly after that with a Washington, <coughs> D.C. Uh, CEO, and we've been writing ever since. Uh, so, so that's a little bit about us now. Let's get t- started and talk about synchronicity. Um, Carl Jung defines synchronicity as the coming together of inner and outer events in a way that can't be explained by cause and effect, and it's meaningful to the person who experiences it. In our book, Seven Secrets of Synchronicity, which was the first book we wrote about synchronicity, we explored the seven types of synchros we had identified. So today, we're going to talk about Secret Six, The Trickster. Okay, it's a well-known archetype, and <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's a well-known archetype and mythological figure among indigenous people. Loki among the Norwegians, Coyote among Native Americans, Kokopelli among the Anasazi, Hopi, and Zuni. So, in our book, we define uh, the trickster as a synchronicity that reveals itself with a twist of humor or wry irony, so uh, so startling that it stops us in our tracks. The trickster often appears to remind us uh, not to take ourselves so seriously. One of the things we found with the trickster was that it's used a lot in movies and novels and good storytelling. Uh, In Lord of the Rings, for instance, the sneaky lurking Gollum character Smeagol is the perfect trickster. He usually had a private agenda of one sort or another that prompted him to mislead the hobbits, or the hobbitsies as he called them, on numerous occasions and to trick them into believing he could be trusted. So how does Smeagol work in our lives? Well, here's an example. Some years ago, I was I got a three book contract that started with a book called Esperanza. And I was coming to the second book and I really wanted there to be a big time travel element in it. But I, I kind of needed a confirmation from the universe so Rob and I were in Orlando at a Scottish festival, and I, they had a lot of different types of displays. I went over to a display of clothing, and what do I find but a shirt uh, made by a company called Time Travel in Ecuador, which is where my trilogy was set. So I was elated. I thought, okay, okay, this is, this is going to be the, the next book. It's Time Travel. I got my confirmation from the universe. Well... When I passed the idea past my editor, she said, no, no, no time travel. Time travel books don't sell. So I was like, I was stunned. And then I started laughing about it because I realized this was a trickster thing. I'm still not quite sure what the message was, except that it might have just been the law of attraction because I so badly needed confirmation about this time travel thing. Okay. I also have a story about a trickster's synchronicity. This took place about the time that uh, shortly after I had met Trish, I was uh, had guests visiting me, uh, a woman named Hannah from Norway, and her boyfriend, George, who was a kind of a freelance New Age minister in Negril, Jamaica. And they just came from Jamaica. And so I, uh, they spent a couple of days uh, with me and then I was taking them back to the airport and we got into this really intense, spiritual, deep, cosmic conversation. George was, uh, I think, started it and it, uh, it, it got really intense. And I just had this feeling that was uh, something strange was going to happen. And what, what happens is a car passes us on our left, a, a little yellow sports car, and the license plate says Zen 665. And George pointed out, look at that, Zen uh, Zen 665. Wouldn't it be interesting if we saw Zen 666? And what happens? A couple minutes later, another car passes us. It says the license plate is actually Zen 666. That was mind-blowing. I mean, what were the chances 
of that happening. And, you know, so it was like a uh, trickster was right in the car with us laughing at uh, our astonishment. And uh, I talked about that story for years to people. And, uh, you know, it was like uh, uh, I would talk about it over and over. And then one day I was I was outside uh, in our neighborhood out on a street and a car goes by. It's a different color car, a red car, and it stops at a light and it has that same license plate, Zen 666. So, you know, what does this mean? Uh, it just was a, like a reminder that life is more mysterious that, than we can imagine and that uh, the ultimate uh, riddle of synchronicity just sometimes, sometimes just defies definition. Yeah, I was, but what, but what did it mean for you? That, 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 because it's about the personal message, too. Yeah, it was like uh, maybe that I needed to be more zen in my life. <laughs> you know, I was going through a transition in a relationship at the time, and it was a very tough time. And uh, maybe when that second, uh, when I saw it again later on, it meant that uh, I had passed the test, possibly. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, well, my dad had us <laughs> had a trickster synchronicity and he knew the the meaning of it immediately at the time he had parkinson's and he had been living with us for a couple of years and we got to the point where we couldn't take care of him anymore so he moved to georgia where my sister was the head nurse at a, a an assisted living facility and it, he was pretty immobilized by then i mean he, he could get around a wheelchair but it was a really isolated time in his life and so he moved into this room on the second floor of the, of the facility. And a couple of weeks, my, my mother, by the way, had already died uh, three years before from complications from Alzheimer's. So my dad was pretty worn out. But he moved into this room on the second floor. And a couple of weeks after he moved in, a uh, woman moved in across the hall from him. And she was in her 80s, I think. By this time, my dad was probably 90. And she turned out to be a former school classmate he'd known for more, more than 70 years ago when they both lived in a small town in Illinois. And they hadn't been in contact? No, not in contact at all. And so I, I was like blown away by the synchronicity. And I, my dad was not amused. He said, look, the universe has really twisted sense of humor. I don't, I didn't like her. I don't like her any more now than I did back then. So to him, it was just kind of his life, in a sense, coming full circle. Right. I think that was yeah, why he, he didn't, didn't like it. He remembered the woman. He didn't care for her. And uh, now that he was seeing her again, he didn't like her. He didn't like her much anymore uh, this time either. So it's kind of a. And I think, you know, after I thought about this for some time, I thought maybe the the message of this particular synchro for him, trickster, was that really came down to David Bohm's a quote from him the physicist David Baum, deep down, the consciousness of mankind is one. It was something my dad desperately needed to learn at that phase of his life. Okay. So I've got one more trickster story to tell. This, this one is uh, about the trickster as an ally. So sometimes the, the trickster can improve the odds when your back is up against the wall. And that's the message in this uh, following incident that uh, – dates back to the early 17th century in the Scottish Highlands. So for decades, the McGregors and the Campbells had battled each other in disputes, usually involving land. So in 1603, encouraged by the Campbells, King James VI issued an edict banning the use of the name McGregor. I've heard about this all my life. <laughs> it's a, it's Are you a, banned? <laughs> it's called a proscription uh, on the name, and it lasted for until 1774. So uh, that would be 171 years that you couldn't use the name uh, McGregor. So in the early years of the prescription, McGregors were hunted as criminals by the Campbells, and one of the most notorious of the outlaws was Colum, Colum McGregor, who's the grandfather of the famed Rob Roy McGregor. So, Who Rob is named after. Yes. <laughs> So in one of his uh, numerous escapades uh, told by Forbes McGregor in the book Clan Gregor, Cullum 
was hiding on an islet in Loch Katrine, and the Campbell men were camped on the uh, woodsy shore, close enough for their voices to carry over the water. Uh, Cullum had uh, taken the precaution of sinking all the boats uh, on the shore except the one he had used to go out to the islet. So knowing that the islet uh, was barren, the Campbells thought they would just starve Cullum into, sur into surrender. But as night fell on that first night, one of the band, uh, who was a cobbler by trade, lit a fire to prepare for a meal. Cullum took aim at the smoke and shouted a curse. Now, I cannot uh, read this very well. This is a, a curse in Gaelic. I'll try. Thogan thaw a crown throw salat ear. Never mind. Something like that. <laughs> So, uh, and he, as he fired the bullet, the bullet struck the cobbler right in the forehead, killing him. So loosely uh, translated, that means, get lost, you slimy crook. <laughs> However, but in Gaelic, the word crook has a second meaning, means cobbler. So the McGregors on the shore, or the Campbells on the shore, had heard the shout, but misinterpreted the meaning when the cobbler dropped dead. They quickly agreed that Cullum must have second sight and might pick, pick them off one after another. So they fled in fear, and Cullum rode to shore and escaped and lived to enjoy a peaceful old age in Glencairn. Oh That's a weird one. <laughs> yes. um, in our book, The Seven Secrets, there actually are more than seven secrets, but we were limited by the publisher who wanted the alliteration of seven secrets of synchronicity, the S's. So... The seven that we wrote about, the first one, the first secret shows us that once we recognize coincidence is meaningful, we open ourselves to new information, new possibilities, new belief systems. And we call this one the knowing. The second one, the second secret, oops, uh, we call the heart. And that's because it reveals that synchronicities are deeply intertwined with our emotions. And that's one of the reasons that people tend to have to, tend to experience a lot of synchronicities at pivotal points in their lives, marriage, divorce, death, birth, that kind of thing, and move that's significant. So the, the third secret is called the theory. And synchronicity uh, is the granddaddy of all paranormal phenomena, telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, and remote viewing. That's our perspective perspective on it. No, actually it isn't. It's Jung's. It's Jung's, yes. yeah. And Jung was the one who said that. Right, and we adapted. Yeah. This, uh, and, okay, the fifth, that was fourth. fourth. Oh, fourth. the fourth. The fourth is the creative. And the idea here is that creativity lies at the heart of synchronicity. And in subsequent um, podcasts, we're going to have, we're going to explore all of these. But the creative is one of the most interesting simply because over the years, writers, artists, musicians have all really tapped into the future through this particular so, secret. So the fifth secret is called the clusters. Synchronicity manifests itself in clusters of numbers, names, objects, words, and, and symbols. Here's a quote uh, from Robert Anton Wilson in the 14 times. I now have almost as many weird 23s <laughs> in my files as Charles Fort once had uh, records of rains of fish and people are always sending me new ones. And the numbers that the uh, types of clusters that people t seem to experience the most involves numbers, which is always fascinating. So we'll get into that too. The sixth one <clears throat> is, uh, is the trickster, which we've talked about. And the seventh is the global. And the global is, Really interesting. It's when synchronicities manifest themselves through global events and the universe seems to be addressing us as a collective. So throughout these podcasts, we'll be talking about all seven of them. But we would also add divination as one type of another type of secret and also travel synchronicities. People experience a lot of synchros when they travel. We could do a whole show on travel synchronicities. Yeah. I've had a lot of strange ones. Meeting people over and over again who you, you shouldn't be meeting again. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and also animal oracles was another. What, what, what about the hologram? 
Well, you can talk about that. No, I'm just asking you to. <laughs> <laughs> um, the hologram is the way I think of the hologram is that we're living in it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like being in the Matrix. It, it goes back to that the movie, The Matrix. You know that there was a certain underlying truth in that movie. And anyway, we'll get into the hologram at a later point. Okay. All right, and then. Uh, we want to use uh, the final space for uh, our podcast, something called the Writer's Corner. And we're, we're going to discuss uh, something about writing or the written word or the publishing industry. And since this is our first episode, I thought it, that talking about how I came to be the author of seven Indiana Jones novels uh, would make a good starting point. So... In the creative arts, there's a kind of cynical saying or homily that in order to be successful, it's not how good you are, but who you know. So I remember thinking about that when we were uh, starting out uh, in the early 1980s and thinking, I hope that wasn't true because we didn't know anyone. Uh, we'd, <laughs> have to, <laughs> we'd have to do it on our own. So when I met Trish, she'd just finished writing her sixth unpublished novel. and She wrote one novel a year for six years and... Uh, no one knew her, and all the publishers rejected her novels. So it seemed that the, the saying was uh, was true. Yet it wasn't quite true, because along the way, Trish had been introduced to another writer who was a bit further along in her, but still unpublished. Uh, th this writer knew a, a literary agent who was looking for clients. So Trish contacted uh, the agent, uh, who read her first novel and took her on as a client, and that's why her novels got out to publishers, even though they were being rejected one after another, year after year. But so the coincidental meeting of the other writer led to uh, a contact in the publishing industry, but uh, not a contract yet. So the editor who bought Trish's first novel, In Shadow, which, as I said, was her sixth one, read it one weekend after watching the first episode of Miami Vice, uh, he was startled that both the novel and the TV show featured a black cop and a white cop as partners, and both were set in Miami. So Trisha's novel involved a murder that was linked to a, a new designer drug. So M Miami Vice went on to become hugely popular, and the same editor, a couple of years uh, after buying In Shadow, arranged for Ballantine Books to publish a book called The Making of Miami Vice, and uh, he asked Trisha and uh, Trish and me to uh, to write it. Uh, so oh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. So so there there was a connection that uh, that led us uh, to a project for us. Yeah, we went to uh, uh, stayed in on Miami Beach and interviewed people, and uh, then went out to Los Angeles. Got to meet Michael Mann. Yeah, that was that was a fun assignment. Okay, so the so the original creator of Miami Vice, his name his name was Anthony Yurkovich. And after Miami Vice became a big success, he moved on and created a TV series called Private Eye, which you probably never heard of because it didn't really take off. But another editor at uh, Ballantine Books thought it was going to be a big hit and decided to publish a couple novels that were based on scripts from the series. And uh, our agent recommended me to the editor, and I was offered the chance to write one of those novels. So the other writer who was hired to write the other one dropped out of the project unexpectedly, and the, the editor turned to me and asked if I could write the second one in a very short dead, deadline. And I was, I, I was able to did, do so, and as a result of making the deadline, uh, a short time later, the same editor came back and asked if I would like to write a novel based on the script of a, a new Indiana Jones movie that would be called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So yeah, I, I, took, <laughs> I took that offer. Uh, so that novel went on to be a New York Times bestseller, and Lucasfilm asked if I was uh, interested in writing a, an original series of Indiana Jones novels. Uh, we decided that they would take place in the 1920s when Indy was just starting out his, his career as an archeologist. So it was a, a synchronicity here. I had uh, started my college career with the intent of becoming an archaeologist, but switched to journalism in my uh, junior year. And then after graduating, I worked at, uh, at a variety of newspapers over the next uh, dozen years. And I would work a year, a year and a half, 
And then I would quit and take extended trips to Mexico, Central, South America, Europe, North Africa, where I'd always end up at the ancient ruins because I was still interested in archaeology. And all those trips over that 12 year period served uh, as research for uh, eventually for my Indiana Jones novels. So I had four months to write each novel. So the day I finished one, the next day I began the next novel. And the last one, Indiana Jones and the uh, interior world was published in 1992. So back then there was no Google uh, to look things up. And so uh, it wasn't as easy to do basic research on destinations and artifacts as it is now. So, so he would have probably needed months in between books if he hadn't already traveled to these countries. Possibly. So the bottom line, it takes talent and it takes connections. And these connections all, often come about through meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. Um, one of the things that we're going to be featuring as sort of in between podcasts is an astrology forecast, which will start out as a monthly forecast for each sign. And then as we move along a weekly forecast um, for the signs. And so that's going to be called star power. We hope you'll drop by and listen. And thank you for joining us. I think this is the Mystical Underground signing off. Rob? Yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks for jo <laughs> joining us. Uh, this is Rob and Trish McGregor signing off the Mystical Underground episode number 001. Okay. Thanks for joining the Mystical Underground. Listen to the podcast at www.themysticalunderground.com. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Follow Trish and Rob on Instagram at Trish and Rob McGregor. Follow the podcast on Twitter at The Mystic Cast. Visit the blog, blog.synchrosecrets.com. Visit the book site phenomenon111.com Until next week, thank you for listening and stay mystical. The, the Rider's Corner, a really big truck. Yeah, yeah. That, I know, I heard yeah, that, that one. Up. Well, maybe that's a good background sound for <laughs> Indiana Jones. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he did uh, find himself hanging off trucks every once in a while. Yeah, that's right. right. Uh, <laughs> True.